This podcast may contain content that is graphic and disturbing in nature. Listener discretion is advised. During the 1980s in Canada, Cindy James was purportedly the victim of over 100 acts of violence, which included both psychological and physical abuse. However, even with a police investigation and help from a private investigator, her attacker could never be identified. And eventually, the police would come to suspect that Cindy was actually perpetrating these acts against herself. Was Cindy her own assailant, or was she the victim of a disturbed individual whose plan was to first torture Cindy and then murder her? This is a bonus episode, The Cindy James Story Reexamined. Amy. Hey, Megan. Amy, I'm super excited for our guest today. Me this, too. Thank Very you. excited. This is a special episode that we are doing in response to all the emails and contact we got from listeners. People were going crazy after the Cindy James episode that we did and with their theories and ideas and questions. And so in this episode, we are joined by Dr. Scott and Dr. Shiloh. LA-based forensic psychologists and hosts of the amazing podcast, LA Not So Confidential. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. With four doctors, we're going to solve this thing today, yeah, right? right? Seriously. <laughs> We've got no, this, I, guys. Th- I, I got to tell you, I'm one of, I mean, I'm a huge fan of, of the show anyway, from even your, your first podcast, but I, this Cindy James, when you were guys reached out and said, hey, give this a listen, and I had never heard of it before. It's fascinating. It's beyond fascinating. And maybe, um, guys, if you don't mind, maybe you could tell the listeners a little bit about your backgrounds and what you do. Sure thing. So we are both forensic psychologists in Los Angeles, as you stayed in the introduction of us. And I have worked primarily in two areas of forensic psychology. Majority of my career has been working with previously incarcerated persons when they have transitioned back out into the community. And I specialized in high-risk sex offenders. So it's working on not only their transition back, but obviously prevention of recidivism and um, every mental health issue that can come up simultaneously that's going on with them, whether it be a, a psychotic disorder or mood disorder treating all of the above. And then a little side piece to that is that I would also sometimes work with pre-trial offenders. So people who are actually getting ready to go into prison, um, a lot of them for the first time. So it's it's basically psychological prison prep and also a lot of work with anxiety and depression disorders. And I still do that in a private practice. But in the last four years, I have moved into law enforcement psychology. So I work and directly employed with a large law enforcement agency here in Southern California, where I provide clinical services to law enforcement officers, as well as consultation and training to the department. And then I'm part of their crisis negotiation team. Thank you, Shiloh. Dr. Scott, can we turn it over to you? Sure. So my path is a little bit different. Shiloh and I did meet at the the forensic site where we both uh, trained as internships and then she stayed on. So I, I had a little bit of an intersection there for a year with her. She also forgot to mention like the big, you kind of buried the lead there, Shiloh. Shiloh is former law enforcement herself, which is a big deal, oh, that's which I right. think is what is really a special um, aspect that she brings to our creative work together. I was in entertainment here in Los Angeles for many years. I was a casting director, um, a line producer, post-production producer, talent manager. And then when I moved into uh, pursuing psychology, I really started out at the master's level and thought I would just be in private practice. And then I got introduced to the idea of forensics and um, then went into a doctoral program that is a clinical program that had an emphasis in family forensics, like doing expert witness, family evaluations, custody evaluations. And that just sort of lit this fire in me that I had no idea that I was even interested in. And I worked in the, um, the California Department of Corrections for several years on uh, maximum level security yards and also really specialized population yards that are 
unfortunately, the new mental hospitals for those that have an intersection with crime. Like basically across the U.S., our prisons are quickly becoming what used to be psychiatric inpatient. They've got a reason to lock them up. They'll put them on a mental health yard. Uh, I did that for a few years. I then came back to Los Angeles and worked in uh, the Twin Towers County Jail uh, or Twin Towers Correctional Facility, which is the largest uh, jail in the world. Uh, That was an amazing and challenging experience. And now I work uh, I work actually in a co-responder model with law enforcement to follow up in the community for high risk individuals. So we pursue people that fall through the cracks to try and get them back into treatment. Sometimes we find the mentally ill from around the country and around the world and we, we, we repatriate them to their homes because they are problematic to themselves and to the community here in Los Angeles. And um, we do things like uh, threat assessment, risk assessment. We have a particular program that is fascinating where uh, we really try and strongly intervene when an individual is identified to us that may be heading towards violent extremism, including mass shootings or mass bombings. We're, the first thing we want to do is really see what we can do to defuse the situation and redirect the individual before it becomes embroiled in the legal system. So yeah, um, and Shiloh and I have been really very, very close friends. Our families are, are very close and this has been our baby for the last three years um, and we've had a great time. I mean, it's, I, I love, I have to say, I love your podcast because you guys are so tight and we are not tight. We are 90 minutes <laughs> of blabbing back and forth. So our <laughs> listeners have a particularly strong constitution for listening to me drone on. I'm quite proud of them. <laughs> Just because Amy and I have no patience. <laughs> I love it. You guys are like the Ernest Hemingways of true crime. I love it. Well, thank you. We appreciate it. We love your podcast. And you two are really exceptionally qualified to especially shed light on this. On, on By the way, on probably every one of our cases. Yep. But on this one, I can't wait. For those of you who haven't yet listened to this case, we covered it back in episode number 32. I'm going to give a brief recap today, but if you'd like to hear the long version, you may want to go back and listen to episode 32 of Women in Crime first. And what I'm going to do today is recap the Cindy James story, and then we're going to get input from forensic psychologists on their opinions um, about what really happened to this woman. This is a true mystery. Did you guys feel it? It was like mysterious when you were doing it? Oh, yeah. It's a twist and turn, goes back and forth. There's so many factors that could lend to either option. It's here. it's so complex. And, you know, and it's so complex. And also it's so one of the things that Shiloh and I immediately commented on as we were going back and forth is that it's shrouded in time by maybe only a couple of decades. But what makes it more problematic is that the field of psychology and particularly forensics has come light years since that time. So, you know, we're, we're going to be saying like Shiloh and I were saying is like, we're not going to, we're not gonna be able to give any kind of definitive answers, but we do think that we can shed some light on things that are important factors as to what it might happen at that time. Well, we'll take it. Or as Shiloh said at the end, the four of us will just solve this thing. But before, I would love that. Before we solve it, let me remind listeners a little bit about this case, just so you guys have a refresher here. So Cindy James was born in Ontario, Canada in 1944. Um, she was one of six children, described as a very sweet, gentle, loving person. She was very focused, both academically and professionally. Early on, graduated and became a nurse. She worked, if you recall, for um, a children's home, like children who had emotional disturbances. And I mean, for all intents and purposes, by her very early 20s, she was very established professionally. She also married someone, um, a doctor that she met, Dr. Roy Makepeace, and he was 18 years older than Cindy. They would wind up spending, you know, about 15, 16 years together, but they divorced in 1982. And that's when the trouble began for Cindy James. In October of 1982, Cindy began calling the police department and reporting acts of violence committed against her. Now, we know that the first complaint she made was really just a prank. She said, someone's been calling me and pranking me, breathing heavy into the phone. You know, she was a little bit scared, but this was, you know, something that's happened to most of us, right? We've, most of us have gotten prank phone calls. But what happened was her calls 
began to become more frequent to the police. And she was reporting incidents of aggression against her that were escalating. So she was reporting that the lights outside of her home were tampered with and there were phone wires cut and then there were threatening phone calls. And then eventually Cindy was physically attacked. There were a couple of incidents that she reported, but one notably was when her friend came over and found her hiding in her backyard. She said that someone had tried to strangle her with a pair of stockings, and she actually had the the stocking hose around her neck. There was another incident where Cindy was found wandering around on a really cold winter night um, near a college campus with no shoes or coat on, having no memory of what happened to her. There were... A couple of other incidents, one was, you know, she was found in a ditch with pantyhose again, tied around her neck and suffering from hypothermia. And in that incident, she had bruises, she had, you know, marks all over her. But again, she still didn't remember what happened to her. Cindy became frustrated. The police became frustrated. Cindy thought that they weren't helping her. And while at first the police were really attentive and believed, you know, that Cindy was a victim... They changed their minds and they came to believe that every time they investigated or put someone on surveillance or had put a phone tap in, nothing would happen. And because of this, I think they got frustrated as well. And they eventually came to believe that Cindy was just doing this all to herself and this was all just for personal attention. After that frustration um, and after having, you know, I, I believe she also was at some point, you know, she spent some short amount of time, a couple weeks in a mental um, hospital. So after she was hospitalized psychiatrically for a couple of weeks, she also wound up getting herself a private investigator because she wanted help. She wanted help with two things. A, I think she wanted some level of security, but B, she wanted to prove to people that she wasn't making this up. She wanted help catching her assailant. And so she hired Ozzy Caban and he had, you know, provided some security for her. He gave her a two-way radio. And then he describes another really disturbing incident in which he heard weird noises through the two-way radio at her house. And so he rushed over and he found Cindy, I mean, in an awful state on the ground. Her hand had been nailed into the floor. I mean, we are talking about real brutality here. Unfortunately, it escalated into Cindy James' murder or Cindy James' suicide. Either way, Cindy James died. On May 25th, 1989, she had gone to do some shopping. Reportedly, she was going to pick up her paycheck, but Cindy didn't make it home then. And the police found her car in a mall parking lot. They found blood on uh, the driver's side, and they found Cindy's groceries still in the car. Her wallets were strewn about. I mean, it didn't look good. They knew that there was foul play of some type. And about two weeks later, they found Cindy James' body in the yard of an abandoned house. And her hands were tied behind her back. Her feet were tied. She had injection marks on her body. Toxicology reports confirmed that she had a massive dose of morphine, but there weren't any needles found near her body. There was also, as there had been with all previous events, a black nylon stocking around her neck showing strangulation. That was one of the common threads through every one of her attacks. The police believed that Cindy injected herself somewhere else and wandered to the site where she eventually died, that this crime happened at her own hands. They wound up having an inquest, a very long inquest, I think the longest one at the time in Canada. Uh, It was about three months. There were 80 witnesses. And at the end of this long, extensive inquest, the conclusion was we still don't know. Cindy's ex-husband, Dr. Makepeace, testified. He was always considered a suspect, but they could not conclude that he was the perpetrator. There was also along the way a police officer that Cindy had dated, and I believe he was a suspect as well, which some say would have explained why there was never any police around when, you know, Cindy was being surveilled or watched by the police because he knew better. But in the end, the truth is there's still a huge question mark over what happened to Cindy James. Now, when Amy and I did our original episode, we did this with the help of a student. And so we had read what all, you know, her opinion was and we discussed ours. And our student Kelly's opinion was that Cindy was doing this to herself and that she likely suffered from factitious disorder, otherwise known as Munchausen. We also discussed the idea that Cindy had dissociative identity disorder. Uh, These were two of the ideas. If Cindy was possibly doing this to herself. 
I concluded that someone was actually victimizing Cindy other than herself. I had said that I thought it was someone who was intelligent and organized and who stalked Cindy for some time and knew the patterns and details of her life. So my conclusion was more likely an outsider than an insider. And Amy, do you remember what your conclusion was? I also believe that Cindy could not have inflicted all of those injuries upon herself. So that was a brief recap of the events that led up to Cindy's death and our opinions. And again, please go back and listen to episode 32. But now that we have all the information, I am so excited to turn this over to Dr. Scott and Dr. Shiloh to hear what their opinions are on this topic. Guys, I can't wait any longer. What what <laughs> what'd you come up with? Well, uh, it, more more questions and answers, maybe. No, yeah. I, you know, I think with anything like this, I kind of start with this mind map. Okay, let me simplify it down to a couple of options, and then let's sort of go out from there. And really, we're looking at an option of either Cindy did this to herself or somebody else did. So I want to start with kind of the option of wrapping our minds around her actually being able to do this herself. Okay. We we have looked into this before in this sense of people who falsify their own attacks, because I think yes. that's really hard for the general population to understand, like, what could bring somebody to do that? But it does happen. It happens a lot. There's several, several cases out there. And there's always some sort of goal or need that is being met for this person. Definitely attention is one of them. It's not always attention, but attention is one of those that just seems so unrealistic to others. But for that person, it's worth doing these acts. Usually when attention is the goal, it could mean a lot of different things for the person. It can mean that, you know, they're trying to get a need met of not feeling seen by others before. Mm -hmm. Maybe they are truly victimized um, in a different way and they're feeling that that never got justified. So now they're trying to create a situation in which it gets remedied for them. Um, another reason that people falsify their own attacks, and we really looked into this when the whole Jesse Smollett case happened, mm -hmm. because people were just like, their minds were blown of how that could happen. Right. Uh, but sometimes it's for benefit, and benefit could also mean a lot of different things. It could it could mean an alibi. If I say that I was kidnapped and <laughs> held over here, then it means I wasn't over here doing this thing that I wasn't supposed to be doing. Not necessarily criminal, but it could be to gain sympathy. It could be treated nicely. We know people fake entire cancer diagnoses to have money and potlucks thrown for them and candlelight vigils and they go far. You know, Oprah Winfrey did this as a teenager. Have what? you ever, she, and she's very, she's very open about it. Like oh. she, she told, tells it anecdotally on her show that when she was like maybe 11 or 12, um, she had to get glasses and her mother would not buy her the frames that she wanted. So she broke them and then kind of like turned all the furniture over and knocked the bookshelves over oh and then laid God. on the ground. And when her mom came in, she tr tried to convince her that, you know, some crazy person came in here. That's amazing. And broke, broke my glasses. <laughs> broke my glasses. So the mother, her mother was not having it at oh, all. I, I love awesome. Oprah. She's that sounds perfectly amazing. reasonable to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know about that. That's amazing. <laughs> Actually, going back um, on track, um, I just want to ask a question about this. Did, um, did Cindy James have any history of attention seeking that anyone saw? Not that I saw. No. No. Okay. As you're giving potential explanations, I'm trying to right. see if she fits into any... That's one of the challenges. Like if we had extensive interviews with mm -hmm. family and friends that could shed light on that, you know, you could see from like childhood, was there a groundwork for this being laid? And, and that's, that's what's so tantalizing about this case is we don't have those things. So we're, we're trying to fill in some of the spaces like Shiloh's doing right now. You know, if we were doing a psychological assessment that we wouldn't just go with Cindy's story. Of course, we would want that collateral information from other people and fill in as much as possible. We just have what we have to work with here today. So I, that's why I say it does create end up creating more questions.
Megan, this year, I'm refocusing on what it means to take care of myself, and it could not be easier than with Daily Harvest. They've been one thing that makes me feel better about my day and myself. No need to overthink any of your meals for the week with Daily Harvest. Smoothies for breakfast, crisp flatbreads for your lunch or dinner, and food that's perfect for cooler weather, like their perfectly roasted harvest bowls and soups. Have you had any of the bowls yet? I'm obsessed with the bowls. I'm not <laughs> kidding you. It's so good that even my kids and my husband ate it, and they never like stuff like this. Usually, I'm kind of upset because this is usually my thing, and now they're starting to want it. Don't share. I also had the cauliflower flatbread oh. with kabucha and sage. Have you had that? No, but that's it looked, the one I sent you a picture of. It looked absolutely delicious. What did you say, too? You said it was amazing in caps. It was amazing and so filling. Daily Harvest is undeniably delicious, clean food without any of the prep. Get started today. Go to dailyharvest.com and enter promo code WOMEN to get $25 off your first box. That's promo code WOMEN for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. Dailyharvest.com. I've been looking for ways to make home more comfortable, especially since I have a cat. So covering up the litter box smell is an absolute must. I love working from home and I love being with Anna, of course. That also means that I'm around Anna's litter box a heck of a lot more. But then I found Pretty Litter and it does so much more than trap odor. Pretty Litter is unlike any cat litter I've seen. It's ultra absorbent crystals, trap odor instantly, and last up to a month. When they say that it, it traps the odor, it really does. Megan, your house never smells. Honestly, thank you. I appreciate that. I think it's more because of Pretty Litter. And the truth is, it just doesn't smell like other litters. And I really appreciate it so much more. But here's why Pretty Litter is my all-time favorite. It changes colors to help detect early signs of potential illnesses, including urinary tract infections and kidney issues. And Pretty Litter arrives safely at my door in a small, lightweight bag. And you don't have to worry about carrying it up to your apartment. No, and that's one of the worst things for me because I'm on a third floor of an apartment building and I hated lugging heavy litter. This makes my life much easier. Do what I did and make the switch to Pretty Litter today. Get 20% off your first order by visiting prettylitter.com and use promo code WOMEN. That's prettylitter.com, promo code WOMEN for 20% off. prettylitter.com, promo code WOMEN. But what we found with, with our previous research and looking to people who fake their own attacks for whatever reason, and of course, sometimes it's monetary, you know, insurance benefits, for those who falsify hate crimes, sometimes they really are being, they are suffering some sort of harassment, but then they up the ante because they believe it's not being taken seriously like it should be. Right. And sort of stage something for themselves. But we found it was quite closely linked with personality disorders more than anything else. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Scott, to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. I mean, without going, we can't go a deep dive into personality disorders, but, you know, like you mentioned, Amy, the possibility of um, attention seeking, you know, we have histrionic personality disorder, which usually is characterized by overt sexuality as a means to get attention or a very sort of overblown dramatic presentation. But we also have borderline and, you know, borderline personality, really, there's a there's a big overlap with a lot of the behaviors that happen. But again, we just don't have enough information. I will say for me, the things that do put a pin in the possibility of this is there's indicated from your uh, podcast and from what I read that there was a history of abuse in the family, that she had a very authoritarian, not authoritative, authoritarian and overbearing father. That sends up a red flag for me. And then there's the possibility of uh, really harsh capital punishment when she was a child. So what does harsh capital punishment to a child mean to us in 2021? It is very different so from different. what it would have been defined as in the 80s, right? What some um, authoritarian parents have been getting away with up until the last decade or so has been really rough. So if we do lay the the possibility, the groundwork of possibility for her to have trauma in her early years, possibly underlying issues as well, like if they're, you know, if there is a genetic predisposition towards personality disorders or possibly even some psychosis, mm-hmm. those things could have developed down the road. The, the thing that doesn't add up as we move through this is that these incidents are so dramatic and no one else is witnessing them. Yeah. So that doesn't happen. And in my work, you know, one of the, I've had four, four cases now where my detective partner and I 
have gone to homes of people that do not appear to be low functioning, mentally ill. They are people who held jobs and are either now retired or on, you know, sick leave. They've paid their bills. They've been in relationships and they are suffering from delusional disorder, you know, and which is not a personality disorder. But these people believe that the minute they turn around and don't lose their focus on the front door, somebody's coming through the front door and moving their belongings around or stealing. And as, as we talk about in our podcast, particularly with delusional disorder, it's fixed. You, you, you are not moving delusional disorder with an antipsychotic medication. You might get some flexibility anyway, taking it back around to Cindy is like, this is what's so fascinating to me is I myself don't believe that she could have done all of this alone, although she could have done a lot of it, but the possibility of her having a personality disorder coming from a history of trauma may very well have linked her to someone who was abusive and she was involved in an abusive relationship and either unwilling or unable or a combination of those two things to be authentic and transparent with law enforcement and the people around her. There are too many things that don't add up. That's an interesting insight because that was something that, you know, Ozzy, the private investigator and her family had suspected that she was harboring a secret. She was getting ready to share it. She never made it to that point. But They also thought that Cindy knew her attacker and just wasn't saying it or was not divulging something. I I strongly believe that. I really strongly believe that she knew who who this was. I just now I did want to ask you a question. Also, we we talk about the two way radio. Do they mean a walkie talkie? You know, what's funny. I think that's exactly what it was. (laughs) Yes. Okay, so if it's a walkie-talkie, you don't transmit sound unless you're pushing the button. That's correct. Yes. It's not possible. So, yes. un- I mean, that it's not like there was a, an ongoing baby monitor mm-hmm. where he could monitor mm-hmm. her from miles away. So no. clearly, you know, he was putting, it sounds like he gave her the walkie-talkie. Hey, if there's a problem, push the button and, and scream and I'll come running. But for there to be some kind of weird noises doesn't make any sense unless she is holding the button down and gurgling Mm -hmm. into the walkie talkie. You know, I have to say, though, I'm unclear as to what the noises were. It could have been that like she grabbed it, held it down and there was a commotion. You know what I mean? Or like a a loud thud or something like I don't know specifically what those noises were, if he heard something continuously or if it was once. So I'm not sure. I'd have to go back also and look at like footage with him. Yeah. So another in kind of circling back around just briefly to the to the personality disorder thing and also a complete cross of boundaries in so many ways is the involvement of the relationship between her and the law enforcement officer is really indicative of poor boundaries. Now, do do poor boundaries indicate a personality disorder? Not necessarily, but personality disorders really do indicate usually a lack of appropriate boundaries. Right. And is this an officer that was working on the case, like local yes. PD to there? It was oh, actually yeah. someone who That's was working on the case. But is that her poor boundaries or his? Both. Both. Okay. But I mean, look. Definitely here, his. <laughs> but here, here's the thing yeah. that I'll tell you that is so fascinating about individuals who have personality disorders. For anybody out there who has ever been at the receiving end of the golden sparkling spotlight of a borderline or a histrionic, there's nothing like it. You feel like you are the most important, the most talented, the most vital person in the world, because that's what they're projecting onto you at that moment. And it's almost magical the way it happens. Now, unfortunately, the other side of it is when inevitably it shifts into the negative, you feel the maelstrom, you feel the lightning, the thunder, the storm, and you are the recipient of all of that uncaffected anger that the borderline or the histrionic feels. So I'm going to just say there's many, many uh, examples of this in American law enforcement, of law enforcement becoming involved with citizens who have personality disorders, right? affairs, sexual interactions, You know, law enforcement is trained to do a lot of things. They're not necessarily trained to recognize like, yeah, you are in a hero position, but this is not real. What's being projected on you right now. So that's very interesting. That's Uh, like a whole other episode. It's definitely that every single day. You do. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) One of the doctors in the um, psychiatric facility where she stayed diagnosed. I mean, they diagnosed her, if you recall, with like hysteria, paranoia, but somebody also diagnosed her with psychopathy. 
And that was not something I saw at all. I'm just wondering. And schizophrenia. Schizophrenia was one of them as well. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't be qualified to like, I'm not qualified to obviously diagnose schizophrenia, but I just didn't see any psychopathic traits, I guess. I don't agree either. I mean, it's, that's just like they were throwing everything. That yeah. doesn't exist. Say to what sticks, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Especially rising to the level to, of actually saying psychopathy mm-hmm. is, I mean, that's a hard bar to meet. Yeah. Um, I don't know about, I mean, even the antisocial personality disorder. I mean, I, I wouldn't even say that she meets criteria for that with what we know. Mm-hmm. I did want to circle back to dissociative identity disorder just oh, to yeah. give your listeners a little bit because I'm sure a lot of people sort of think that that could be what's happening here. And just for a, like a quick and dirty rundown, this is recurrent gaps of time for these individuals who suffer from this that are missing or there's some sort of sensory motor functioning that's being impaired that's going on with these people to where it's it's rising to the the level of putting them into significant distress. Um, so it's actually not that rare. It can be rare for the more severe cases, but if you are driving home from work and you don't really remember your drive, you dissociated. So it's, it's, it's how much, um, information your brain can keep in, (laughs) you know, present in the moment. If you think about random access memory, like is like your computer has, like there's only so much that the brain can handle. And it's Shiloh, I love that example because There's a function to that mild level of dissociation. It's basically your brain is spinning down for a second and letting itself rest. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still functioning. You're still driving. You can still like stop on a dime if you need to. But that's how people have that missing time. But in examples like she's talking about the severe examples, we're going all the way to the end of the spectrum where people are losing, you know, months at a time. Okay. Right. And what we don't really see with it is this severe self-injurious behavior. Even with people with lost gaps of time and not having memories, like kind of her walking around in the cold with no coat, that kind of fits a little bit. I'm like, okay. But the the months, the years, I mean, really years of it. Hmm. Um, Shiloh, I, just to interrupt you because it's important for this. When I talked about DID on their first episode, I had said that, yeah, I don't really think people with these you know extreme cases self-harm in this way. And then it was actually a listener who wrote in and said that I was wrong and that it's a lot more common for self-injury. And I, I think you're saying that it's not that common. That's different. That's okay. a different thing. It, what? How so? So I'm I, when people lose gaps of time, how I'm interpreting that without knowing what you know, research or stats she's pointing to or he's pointing to is that they are injuring themselves in accidental ways, like there are people who have driven and like, how did I get here? And they may be involved in a traffic collision, but like suicidal ideation or self-harm, that sort of thing. Um, that's what I believe is, the person was referring to. And that's what okay. I was referring well, to. And Scott, what I'm, were you going to say? Well, I'm going to go on a limb here and I want to be very careful and respectful to your listener. Yeah, me too. Um, but First of all, DID is a very controversial diagnosis, and I think that it is very overdiagnosed in, by clinicians who don't know what they're talking about. I work with a clinician here in Southern California who is, she's an expert, and she's the one that like, if I need a consultation, I go to her because, and we send people to her to differentiate, like, is this somebody who really has DID or is it something else? And there's a lot of things that can look like DID. But to your listeners points is like, I, I, unless that they're pointing to a study that I haven't, I'm not familiar with, and I would love to see that if it exists, but the idea that an altar would hurt their host is very, very like uncommon. That's exactly what I had said. I thought they were there to more protect the host. That was my point as well. Right. Because self-harm serves a purpose. You don't, the altar doesn't try and hurt its own host, no matter what the level of anger is a person self harms in order to relieve psychic pain. Right. Okay. It serves a purpose. So now this person may be citing that anecdotally and they may have a personal experience with themselves or a family member or something. So I'm not saying that it can't happen, but I will say this, if they point you towards research, please send it over to me because we are always 
looking at whatever is new. Yeah, I certainly will. Thank you. And sorry, Shiloh, I didn't mean to cut you off when you were going to DID. I just didn't want to forget that question. No, not at all. And I, I just want to piggyback on that, that the biggest lesson I learned a million years ago was that there are no absolutes. You know, we can look at statistics and say, statistically, it's more likely she's doing this to herself than some, right? you know, deranged, organized offender is doing that to her. But is it possible? Of course. Of course it is. Maybe we just don't know this, this level of this person. Because I was saying, like, was she the only one? Was there any other women that were being attacked in the area this way? Did this person just pick her and then just stop? <laughs> like, yeah. Good question. You know, it, it, who knows? Who knows? But I lean more towards um, what the majority of the research says, what's more likely, especially in right. these cases. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's always, always an outlier. But DID is, we, we said this a little bit, but DID is also a common response to trauma as well. Mm. So we saw this um, with the documentary, The Keepers. Um, we've seen this in lots of different areas. Every made-for-TV movie about multi-personality you know personality mm-hmm. disorder, there's a trauma there. But there's there is a kernel of truth to that. So they're essentially, some people are, the, the dissociative state happens because it's self-preservation again for the psyche, but some people are actually experiencing not being able to remember that because they don't want to either. So right. it, it's all about self-preservation. It's how our brain functions and works to protect us. Um, this might be a silly question, but with DID, do people usually suffer a traumatic event as a child and then then this emerges in adulthood or typically a trauma happens and then it's more of an immediate response? It, it's, it could be either one of those. I mean, what we're seeing a lot in, you know, what we understand now in post-traumatic stress syndrome, which we're trying to follow the UK model of not saying disorder, but saying syndrome um, as a means to not uh, stigmatize that condition is that, you know, a person who is functional on every level, but then goes through a horrific series of chronic tragedies, such as our soldiers or our law enforcement or, you know, someone who's been sex trafficked, then absolutely. I mean, we see that basically in people, if you've been trafficked and you're forced to endure, you know, being raped multiple times, you're going to dissociate. That's going to keep you safe. And you may have had a wonderful childhood up until the point that you got pulled into trafficking or up until the point you had that um, officer involved shooting or up until the point you were on the battlefield nonstop with IEDs going on around you. But that's a great question, but I think it can be both. But certainly what we do understand for the rare and severe cases of DID that do end up in prominent alters, most of that is coming from childhood. Because she didn't have a ton of traumatic. Well, we don't know. Well, we actually. don't really know. Um, it was reported. Remember that her father yeah. was. She she said that he was abusive. She had told and I guess doctor made yeah. her, you know her husband that. So we don't know what level of abuse. But her perception. I was going to say it's all subjective yeah. abuse mm-hmm. um, in some way, and that could have been traumatic, regardless. Yeah, and look, I don't. This is going to sound. I'm, I'm probably going to get some hate mail on this, but that was a really large age gap. In that relationship. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, and if it was just the age gap or it was just the trauma, it wouldn't be significant to me. But I'm I'm just gonna say that's notable to me that it's a combination that she asserts that she had this experience in her family dynamic. Mm -hmm. And then she picks another wealthy, successful authority figure who's much older than her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that definitely hit me as well. Yeah. Let's look at option B here. Let's let's talk about if this was truly either a stranger perpetrating this crime or somebody that maybe she knows a little bit. What stands out to me that kind of fits in line with this is what is happening to her, if we're assuming that perspective, is that it really does fit in line with what we know about stalking behaviors. So stalking is not about one action. That's why it's so hard to make a stalking case, but it's about a combination or multitude of behaviors that the perpetrator is inflicting on the victim that creates sort of the um, the perfect storm to be able to say, okay, this is stalking. They are being victimized and harassed to significant distress. So it's repeated. It's persistent. Right. It's intrusive. So it can be a legal means of all of that, but it also can be just kind of multiple forms of harassment that feel little, like if you take them out by themselves, mm-hmm. where they're just annoying. 
but when it becomes that cluster of activities, and that's what we're seeing here. I mean, it 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 started almost it's almost a perfect escalation with how low level it started and then went up level by level by level, eventually years down the road leading to her murder. But the hallmarks of stalking is that the perpetrator wants to evoke fear and distress in their victims, as well as a sense of a loss of control over their lives and their environment. And I think this is picture perfect for that. Can I chime in then? Okay. So everything that Shiloh says now, except now, if we just change one aspect, we make it a, an agreed upon or a consent relationship because there are some consent relationships that are abusive and toxic. And we do have evidence. And in fact, Shiloh and I, in one of the case studies that was used with us in our training at the forensic site is almost an example of, of what we're, in fact, actually way more um, physically abusive with, with way more significant wounding where a person has been drawn into a BDSM relationship with a master and who has coerced her. Like, you know, I own you, I own you. And some of the things that we were like this particular case study was like jaw dropping and more common than it should be. I'm not going to say it's common, but like this was an example where in, in looking at Cindy's case, There are so many things that she could not have done alone, but it doesn't make sense unless the guy had unlimited resources. I mean, when we think about the person who really everybody thinks about as being responsible for the Black Dahlia murders, this was a rich individual. If if he is the actual murderer, he was a wealthy, powerful man with fingers in literally every level of LA society, law enforcement, and the judicial system. He had the money to cover his tracks and do anything he wanted. So like Shiloh was saying, is that possible that someone could have stalked Cindy to this extent with all of these resources? It's possible, but it's really not likely without some kind of consent, which I think is what her family and friends were picking up on at the end. Yeah, that she she had more information. She knew someone, but she was scared. Right. So that is kind of almost theory C is that it was somebody that she knew that she was in this BDSM arranged relationship with, and she was a willing participant, but maybe also mashed in with the attention-seeking piece because she's letting law enforcement know about it. And we should be also be very clear that like we, both Shiloh and I, in all of our work, we are very sex positive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a, the vast majority of BDSM relationships are very, very healthy because the, the boundaries are very understood. So, you know, healthy kink is healthy, Mm -hmm, but there are some that are not into it. It's like, it's the idea that, you know, rape is not a crime of sex. Rape is a crime of violence. Right. And there are some BDSM relationships that aren't about intimacy and taking intimacy to a really, you know, a really profound level, but where it's just about working out your own psychopathy, you know, on someone else, unfortunately. I'm wondering if Cindy was a willing participant. I don't know if you could really say the word willing because she was definitely victimized in some way. But if she was consenting on some level, I'm wondering, did she withhold the information maybe because she was embarrassed or because she was protecting that person? Any thought on that? I think it could have been all the above. And even, you know, if it went to the level of her changing from consenting to victim, like the case that Scott and I had a little bit of involvement with that she became fearful Mm -hmm. of this person, Mm -hmm. that if she does tell that he could kill her, Mm -hmm. but if law enforcement caught him, you know, maybe it wouldn't be the same. So she's putting in these calls, you know, especially towards Mm -hmm. the end. But in, in a, if we're talking just straight stalking scenarios, the average amount of time that someone stalks someone else is only 13, not only to diminish them, but yeah. 13 months, which is small in comparison to the time that yeah. this was going on for mm-hmm. Cindy. Right. Wow. Long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the majority of the time, 33% of the time, it's an ex-spouse. Yes. Right. And or a casual acquaintance. Wait, for, first of all, uh, is that... The realm? Have we covered the realm of possibilities? Yeah, let's just well, get into. I, th- I think thoughts, those so. are the realm of possibilities, but okay. I do have a list of things that I can quickly go through that, to me, are confounding in a number of ways. Okay, if that's okay. Yeah, go for it. So I want to start out first with her the description of her being a nurse at age nineteen. That's not a thing. So um, you know, for her to have completed undergrad and get licensed, 
So she could have been the 1980s version of an LVN, which is a licensed vocational nurse. And, and God love what they do because like LVNs all, I mean, I have utmost respect for the medical community. However, they're saying, oh, she had knowledge of injections and all these drugs as a nurse. Well, an LVN would not be doing that level of work. Okay. She could have seen it, but at age 19, it just doesn't seem very likely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's something I wanted to point out. The psychiatric medications at that time you know, look, we, we are in a time right now where our psychiatric medications at the right dose and the right combinations can be like sniper rifles for symptomology in psychosis, which is wonderful. That's not what existed 30 years ago. Right. The arsenal for antipsychotic medications were Thorazine, Haldol, Melaril, Prolixin, and Stelazine, and Lexitane. All of those basically mute you. They just, it's not that they're turning down just the auditory and visual hallucinations and the beliefs, it's turning down everything. everything. You're basically zombifying people. So, she, you know, if she was on a host of those kind of drugs, I think her behavior would have been altered. If she was on and off them, that would have been significant. But there weren't like, you know, they were not being specific with the medications at that time that I think would have been applicable to this case. So that's a point I really wanted to make. The other thing is I reached out to an acquaintance of mine who is a big time uh, uh, bondage expert here in the FET community, the fetish community in uh, Southern California. And his opinion was, look, I'm a ropes master. No, there's no way that this person could have hogtied themselves. It's not possible. Absolutely not possible. And, and I respect his position completely. But then I went and talked to a friend of mine that's a magician, an escape artist at the Ma- Magic Castle. Mm. And he said, absolutely, you could do that. Well, that's what happened in this case, too. Remember, there was an expert who said, no way, and an expert who said, absolutely. Right. But the thing here that is um, that's confounding that I think is very important is that they report that she ingested a large amount of morphine. So the idea that, that she at any time jabbed a needle into her arm, shot herself up with any kind of opiate, and then engaged in tying herself up. That's not going to happen. Opiates hit you so quickly, right. you are gone. And you don't care about tying yourself up at that mm-hmm. point because you're already gone. Right. So all of that leads me back to that there was another person that was involved that for some reason, and that doesn't mean just because somebody else is involved doesn't mean that she didn't have some other serious underlying mental health issues. Mm-hmm. She may have had some prodromal mild schizophrenia or mild psychosis that made her more susceptible to being in this kind of relationship. So those are the things I just wanted to add. No, very interesting. It sounds actually, I mean, this is great, but it sounds like, um, Scott, it sounds like that's your conclusion that, correct me if I'm wrong, that you think she was, you know, she was involved with someone in this kind of relationship, but that it's entirely possible that these aren't mutually exclusive. She could have still had some of these underlying conditions that propelled her into this sort of maybe unhealthy relationship. Yeah. Okay. Shiloh, I'm just curious. What's your, if that's Scott's conclusion, is your conclusion the same or different or? I, it's basically the same. I think there was probably more mental illness than we know about going on with her. For me, the biggest evidence of another person being involved actually is the witness that when the house caught on fire, came outside and saw the man run away from the scene. You know, that could have been a stranger perpetrator, but that could have been the guy that she's like, hey, set the fire, make sure, stick around, make sure nobody gets hurt and that we all get out okay. So for me, having that third party piece is huge. Yeah. But I, with with the evidence that Scott was able to lay out and the expert opinions that he got, I was leaning towards her doing this herself, but I think she was heavy into the attention seeking and it again, sort of intersected with her own mental illness, probably, and this relationship with this other person. All right. Well, listen, I have to tell you, I was, first of all, thank you. That was brilliant. And it was great insight into um, some of the things that we discussed and some new, I had never considered the BDSM relationship. I think that was new and that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel comfortable with my original conclusion, not completely, but that I I do believe there was stranger involvement. But of course, like you said, there's probably more mental illness than we know. Amy? Yeah, I'm just so sad that there are, again, more questions than answers. But I think you laid out a really plausible theory and I, I have so many questions. 
I, I don't actually feel like more questions. I really? Feel, I feel like a, some, yeah, I feel kind of fulfilled well, by this Well, I have questions answer. about Michelle Carter. I have questions about Cherry Papini. All right, I well, she has questions that cases. are for another episode, clearly. I don't blame you. I, I actually... <laughs> I, I, I would want to say that, like, I, I really hope that even with all the time passing that somebody yes. can shed more light. I feel, it just feels like, I wish somebody would do a, a full-on documentary on this because mm-hmm. I, I think that there's got to be someone who knows something. that knew her that worked with her. Me too. That mm-hmm. would give us more insight into this. And hopefully, hopefully with your listenership, this will happen. I, I would love that to happen. And with your listenership, I, I actually, that's my hope as well. When someone asked us recently, like, which cases do you want to solve? I usually have a go-to, but now Cindy James is now my go-to. I want to solve this case. I need to know more. Yeah. So mm-hmm. people who are listening Please give us a tip. Throw us a bone. Um, <laughs> yeah. Literally. Start that web sleuthing on your own. Yes, yes, please do. And really a big thank you to Dr. Scott and Dr. Shiloh. Again, LA, not so confidential. Please check them out. And thank you guys so much for your help. And thank you. we'll catch everyone next time on Women in Crime. Women in Crime is written and hosted by Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg. Our producer and editor is James Varga. Our music is composed by Dessert Media. If you enjoy the show, you can get access to ad-free episodes, exclusive AMAs, and other bonus content for a small monthly contribution through Patreon. To find out more, visit patreon.com slash women in crime.